Welcome back under the big top for another exciting installment of The Cyborg Tinkerer. You may remember from last time that we met Gwen, who is dying of a brain tumor. And also, she wants to have sex with everybody. She went to a circus that she wasn't supposed to go to, even though it was out in the open and everyone knew it was there. And then she got caught by the feds, who are the police, and she passed out. Hello and welcome to Christmas Day. Actually, I'm filming, and in a little bit, in a little bit, we're gonna go next door to my parents and have Christmas. But right now, I'm gonna read a little bit more of the Cyborg Tinkerer because honestly, I kind of just want to really dig into this book. I also am using this bookmark that you probably saw me do in my reader writer Etsy haul that I did a little while ago. Actually, you probably didn't because I don't think anybody watched that. But if you want to see me pick this out. Go check it out. But it's a cool bookmark. What, Nigel? You want some attention? Daddy could pay you some attention. Okay, so this bookmark has little tabs on it that you can place in your book. There's a tab for romance, amazing writing, so funny, plot twist, crying, and remember this. And I've decided to use the romance ones for every time that Gwen has sex. So, we're gonna find out how much sex there is in this book. I am counting her uh, abbreviated, cut short, finger banging in that first chapter. Chapter two, let's go. Right away in the first paragraph, we're reminded again that Gwen is dying, in case you forgot. She is now in a metal bunk. She was examined by a physician on her way into the jail cell, and they were like, yes, she has a brain tumor. How did they, did they like give her an MRI? I don't under, I don't know how advanced the technology of this world is because it's like steampunk but also spaceships so like could they just wave a scanner over her and be like yep that's a brain tumor please state the nature of the medical emergency not explained but somehow she got a, an exam and she's in a cell and the doctors are like yep that's a brain tumor also her bail like they tell her what her bail is and it's 50,000 marks which is apparently a lot in this universe and like all for being found near cyborgs. Cyborgs aren't technically illegal, but making new ones are, and being seen around them is frowned upon, but now it's not just frowned upon. You can go to jail and get an enormous fine. Although maybe actually it partly is because she was also flying around on an illegally modified scooter. So those two things together, don't do those two things or you will have to pay a very expensive bail. I hope she thinks she spares a single thought for her family. Because she's like, well, now I'm going to die in jail. So they can detect that she has a brain tumor with ordinary police medicine, presumably. But they don't have the technology to remove the brain tumor. Also, apparently, they do snail mail. Because she, her parents and siblings, we don't know how many siblings, made her promise to write. But she said she hadn't done that because she was always moving around. So she couldn't send or receive mail. Yes, spaceships. Yes, scanners that can, like, I'm assuming scanners, they don't tell us. Tell re regular police people if you have a brain tumor. No to email. A strange man has come to her door. I'm pretty sure he's going to be one of the romantic interests. Very, very described. Like, his entire outfit is described. A lot of pinstripes. Uh, he's got a cane. And he's just looking like a pimp. And the guard calls him my lord. So, in case you didn't get it, uh, the guard asks uh, anything else, my lord. And then, the, and then we have no. The lordly man said. In case you were wondering if he's a lord, the way he's described, I'm picturing Doctor Facilier from The Princess and the Frog. Gentlemen. The, the suit, the top hat, he's got olive colored skin and dark eyes, and I'm just like, I'm not going to be able to picture anything else now. So I'm going to give you an example of something that is decent but not necessary. So rather than just tell us what the room looks like at the beginning, uh, the author let's cues us in on what the cell looks like a little bit later by saying his eyes swept over the room. A set of bunks, one toilet, one sink, one desk, one stool. Okay. That's an okay way to do it. Wait to describe a space until somebody's looking at it. But we don't care. Like, this is not relevant information that we, the reader, need. We are already picturing a cell that pretty much has all those things except the desk. I didn't picture the desk. So 
It's a good way to describe something. Gwen has wondered three times now what this fancy pants man is doing here in slightly different ways within half a page. Uh, that's maybe a few too many times. Now Gwen is having wall-to-wall -wall brain tumor symptoms, whereas earlier she had none. Now that she's like had a blackout episode, it's all like headaches, nausea, all of the symptoms. So the man sits down next to her, Dr. Facilier sits down next to her, and he has a scroll, which he unfurls. So this is a very paper-based future. Uh, nobody has like data pads or anything, but they could still detect a brain tumor. I on it is her dossier for some reason. Somehow he got this. And he's just like giving us all the info about her. She, she was a, a union ship's lead ship tinkerer at 25. Somebody pointed this out and I don't really know how I feel about it because in steampunk, tinkerer is a little bit more of like a thing, but somebody pointed out that tinkerer doesn't sound like what Gwen actually did because she was an engineer. She is a ship engineer. She keeps the engines running and tinkering is a lot more small and meticulous usually and a little bit more like freeform. Well, it was a crappy ship with a sour engine, mm. so maybe she's not good enough to be an engineer engineer? Maybe. Maybe engineer is like a tier higher than what she was. So Gwen says, well, first of all, she says she was dying again, in case you forgot. I don't know how you would, but she, she reminded you. And then it says advanced surgery could save her, but no one would risk the wrath of the Emperor in the Union. So that makes it sound like it's just the Emperor has decided that technology is bad in general. And so maybe he, he's also the reason that everybody has to use snail mail because like surgery could save her, but it's illegal. I know that turning her into a cyborg is illegal, but not, she doesn't say that. She just says advanced surgery. Okay, here's my headcanon. The emperor is really into steam, the steampunk aesthetic. And so ha he has regressed his space age society as much as possible to be steampunk. So that means that we can't have email or uh, medical advances anymore. His name is Bastian Kabir. I'm gonna continue to call him Dr. Facilier, at least for this episode, I might forget. This is something you probably should have foreshadowed or mentioned when she was watching the circus because she freaks out a little bit since she recognizes his name as the ringmaster or whatever of the cyborg circus, which she was at and she saw him. But she didn't tell us back then that she recognized him, but she's telling us now. Every time she'd heard about the circus, his name was brought up. That would have been super easy to foreshadow, but we're being lazy. And just in case we forgot, she has to remind us that he was the one on stage with the cyborg animals at the circus. Oh, hey, I, I do want to point out something good. I like this little moment where Bastion goes over and pokes her sleeping cellmate with his cane to make sure that the cellmate is asleep so that they can talk in secrecy. And Meg doesn't, the author Meg doesn't spell it out for us and say this is why he did it. She, she just has him do it, and then we, the reader, can figure out why. And that's good. I like that. That's a little bit of good. He's offering her a job, as we all knew would happen. And he's like, you work for us for 30 years. You sign a 30-year contract. And you can never contact your family. And it's like, oh, darn. Because she was so into contacting her family before. So obviously he's offering to remove her brain tumor and replace it with cyborg parts. Cyborg brain, I don't know, um, steampunk cyborg brain. I'm picturing like a little smokestack coming out of her head. And he's like, but you'll lose your memories over time. I don't know why that's necessary. And you'd think that that would be a hindrance if they want her to be their tinkerer for her to lose her memories, unless maybe that counts as muscle memory. Not really sure how that works, but I think how does anything work is just gonna be my mantra throughout this entire book. Gwen starts laughing at the idea so hard she pukes on the floor. I wonder why he's chosen her. Is it proximity? Are there no other tinkerers in prison right now? Is it because he found out that she's got the brain tumor so she'll be easiest to bargain with? Because certainly somebody else probably has some... I mean, there were a lot of poor people waiting to see the circus. None of them could be tinkerers. I guess maybe she's just the very best, like no one ever was. <laughs> And so Gwen goes along with his deal. Shake my hand. Come on, boys. Won't you shake a poor sinner's hand? Good news, everyone. She gets her skimmer back. 
Thank goodness. I don't know how she'd live without her not described space skateboard. There are horses on this moon. They're in a horse-drawn carriage. Somebody brought horses to this moon. How very Firefly of them. She mentions that there are things like steam-powered cars or trains. They're able to fly through space, but they still are in steam-powered cars. I'm gonna assume the spaceships are steam-powered too. Okay, she thinks they might be cyborg horses because she thinks she sees metal teeth, but also she says gleaming steel horseshoes, as though horses wearing metal horseshoes is unusual and proof that they are cyborg horses? That doesn't... Horses wear horseshoes, especially if they walk on a lot of stone streets it's to protect their feet. Ah, uh, I think this might be the one and only time where the book points out something else that lots of people have pointed out. Cyborg tinkerers are supposedly studied as doctors, and I'm no doctor, I don't know a damn thing about biology. I'm a ship tinkerer, those two are very different things. And then they're just like, you'll figure it out. Hand wave! So they're essentially going into international waters to do her surgery. 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 Because they're like, well, technically, by the letter of the law, you can't become a new cyborg on any of the planets in the Union, but it doesn't say anything about the space in between the planets. Very convenient, and you think they'd be using that loophole a lot. This is a pet peeve of mine. I don't know if it bothers other people. When the author reminds you of stuff that you already know as to be like, the character is processing these things, but it just feels like the author reminding you, like, here's what's happened in the book so far. Not long ago, she'd exited the crusty tulip, ready to spend her final days on Anchorage. Now she was leaving the manufacturing moon and about to start a new life as a cyborg. Yes, we know. We have, in fact, been reading the book. It's a pet peeve of mine. I don't mind it as much if a lot of complicated stuff has happened and we need to remind the readers, like, here's some little details that you might need to hold on to because it's going to come up later. But when it's just, here's the two chapters you've read so far summarized, not necessary. So I, I'm thinking that landing on the ground when she fell off her skimmer just, like, ruptured something in her brain because she was fine until that happened, and now she's having just non non-stop symptoms and she's just lost vision in one of her eyes. So, like, her tumor is was kicked into overdrive. We get the first hint that old Bastion here has his ED because she says he had, looks like he hadn't eaten in days. They have what Gwen at least believes are several surgeons that are prepping her. Why do they need her if they have all these people who, who can turn her into a cyborg? Unless maybe these people are just hired for like the one time and then they're gonna go away. But why not just hire some of them instead of Gwen? We also meet the mistress, a red-haired woman who seems to be even more in charge than Bastion. He's in charge, she's more in charge. So she's getting a chip and an implant put into her brain but they still drive steam-powered cars. I'm just really struggling with the technology in this universe. And of course they have to do the surgery without anesthesia because that would interfere with the cyborg parts. Whatever. Now you might be saying, but Julian, that was the aesthetic in Treasure Planet. Treasure Planet doesn't make a lot of sense technologically either. First of all, actually, the technology does seem to fit together better in Treasure Planet, but also Treasure Planet is a children's movie. This is not a book for children, so maybe we should have things explained a little bit better. Once again, we have people appearing. I'm almost sort of glossing over it at this point, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe once Gwen gets her brain tumor fixed, she will be able to see people at a distance. One, two, three, and we're on to chapter three. And no sex happens, so we have nothing to mark, and, uh, yeah. Are we enjoying ourselves? I hope so. And I will see you all again for Chapter 3 when I get to it. Hello, uh, welcome back to more Cyborg Tinkerer. I have an emotional support pie. I'm gonna try to eat it and read it at the same time while sitting in a chair. It's still a holiday weekend. I'm just filming as much as I can. So, Adam is still here. He's, he's hanging out. Our main character is just getting her brain replaced. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Oh, we're getting another point of view. We're getting Rora, who I think is one of the romantic interests. Apparently there's a hierarchy among the performers for some reason. I don't know if this is really going to come up again, but obviously, why wouldn't you start out a chapter without a character you've just introduced being verbally abused by one of her co-workers? That's the best way. 
and she's an acrobat, Rora is, and the other guy, I guess, is an archer, and uh, they hate each other. And he's like, stupid acrobats always swanning around like they own the place. Some of these planet names, I feel like she was not trying super hard. But again, this is, maybe this isn't the kind of book where you try very hard. Uh, sh the planet, the, the moon they came from was called Anchorage, and now they're on a planet called Grandstand. So far, zero points for naming. We meet two new characters, Marzana and Accio, who are pushing a giant wardrobe on wheels. <laughs> this is just clunky. I'll just read it to you. We're, we're learning about Marzana and Accio. They're chatting, <clears throat> nothing of consequence. And then it just says, apropos of nothing, Marzana had once been a man named Jared, but her gender and sexuality were as fluid as the waters beneath them. Okay, what a what an awkward, awkward way to introduce your character as trans. Just like, out of the blue, nothing to do with anything, by the way, their name used to be Jared. Not how I'd recommend you do it, but what do I know? I think it just feels so abrupt. I'm going back to it because I can't quite shake it. I'm like thinking about how would I introduce this character. Not like that. It feels like you're introducing a very personal thing about this person. Just like out of the blue in the text. This is something that could come up as we get to know the character, as they're talking to other characters, as they're having intimate conversations with other characters about their lives and their struggles, instead of just literally jumped at my feet like a dead mouse. Oh, by the way, this is a trans woman. Got a bit of a mystery. I don't know if it's actually gonna turn out to be anything, but their guards always wear masks, and Rora thinks it's maybe because they don't want to be seen associating with cyborgs, but I wonder if it's gonna come up that the guards are like something else. Yeah, and they also lack emotion in their voices. Are they robots? I feel like maybe they're robots. I'll probably mention it a little bit further in, but I did want to talk about with this book how it how much it feels like it wants to be a fantasy book. You can have cyborgs and fantasy. Cyborgs and fantasy mix really well. Like steampunk, cyborgs, and fantasy can mix really well. And this feels so much like it wants to be a fantasy. Like, just make the ships sailing around in a fantasy sea. Name your continent stupid things like Anchorage. And just go with that, because we've got a castle. I know there's a dragon later on in this book. Why isn't it a fantasy? Why is it trying to be a sci-fi? You can get away with so much more in a fantasy. Because sci-fi has science in the name. So we do kind of expect things to make just a smidgy smidge more sense, like their technology, for example, versus with fantasy, you can just be like, it's run by magic. It's magic. Shut up. And airships also mix really well with fantasy. May I introduce you to Final Fantasy, for example? So they've got an entire, like, I don't know if they have the entire planet, but they've at least got a city on this planet with a castle in it dedicated to cyborgs. And it's just allowed to be there? The feds don't come after them? Does somehow, does nobody know about it? I don't know. So many questions. What are the rules? What are the rules? Apparently dragons do attack here, though. Space dragons, I guess. Well, I guess the dragons don't travel through space. The dragons are an invasive species that was put here on Grandstand. Oh, have we got Rora seeing Gwen for the first time? There's a newcomer. She's standing silhouetted in the doorway. She's like dark and mysterious. Apparently she's wearing the clothes of a tinkerer. I guess they have, I would think like uh, coveralls or something, but no. Uh, she's wearing a leather jacket with elbow patches, matching leather pants and tall boots. And goggles. We can't forget the goggles because this is steampunk. Just as Gwen was immediately hot for Rora, Rora is immediately hot for Gwen. Now I'm picturing, because Gwen just got her implant, so she's got a cool cyborg eye now, which I, I cannot help but picture the eye from Treasure Planet on John Silver. Cyborg. I suspect that might be where we're going with that. Um, also, like, the side of her head is shaved so that they could have, you know, done the surgery. And I'm just picturing that now she has, like, a cool side cut. I wouldn't mind that style myself, but I cut my own hair, uh, and I don't know how to do that. Yeah, Rora is thirsty for Gwen right away, and also being like, oh, she's so dark and broody, and I wonder what, what her trauma is, because I want to know. Rora literally, like, pops a lady boner just from seeing Gwen. Is that, is that now a sexual thing? 
As an allosexual, like, that does happen. So you can just, like, just, like, look at somebody and be, like, boner now? Yes. <laughs> wow. Sexual attraction is wild. <laughs> Y'all are weird, okay? <laughs> okay, I have another question about the trans person in this circus. Because we can do such complicated cyborg surgeries, does that mean that gender confirmation surgery is really easy in this world? That'd be something that'd be interesting to know and we're probably never gonna find out. See, that is, okay. See, we could introduce her more naturally that way. If everybody's talking about their cyborg implants, their surgeries, the trauma of their surgeries, and then she could chime in and be like, well, there's another type of surgery that I had that was uh, not as traumatic because I was really excited about it and that was my gender confirmation surgery. And we could all be like, oh, oh, you're trans woman. And like that, if the characters were all talking about stuff and having a moment, is a way more graceful way to introduce the concept than just being like, and also this character used to be a man named Jared. <laughs> or Jason, I don't know, it started with a J. I lost just a smidge of footage here. I'm going to be talking about the mistress now. She's sort of being described as like skinny. She's got like really prominent cheekbones and everything, but I refuse to picture her as anything but like very voluptuous because somebody named the mistress just has to be. It's like a rule. I cannot picture anything but Matron Mama Morton. When you're good to mama, mama's good to you. Ah, now we're really getting introduced to the plot itself. The matron, I'm calling her the matron, the mistress, is explaining that the emperor is throwing some sort of gala and he's invited the circus, which immediately sounds like a trap. Super duper is a trap, but no, we're going with it. We believe him, the man who outlawed cyborgs. We believe that he is a good person who just wants to see the circus. Apparently the emperor makes everybody fear, fear cyborgs because they're super soldiers that be, can be controlled by evil people, which doesn't make any sense, but of course it, he doesn't need to. It's the bad guy's plan. So they, the this emperor who banned cyborgs and imprisoned and then probably had killed the people who invented cyborgs. And like the the cyborg stuff manufacturing plants are all shut down and everything. He says now that if they come and perform for him, he's hoping to prove that cyborgs aren't evil after all, even though he was in charge of the propaganda campaign that made everyone decide that cyborgs are evil. If I was any of the people running this circus, I'd be like, oh honey, you're gonna have to try a lot harder than that to get us to come by you. So we find out that there's going to be a competition because apparently the whole circus can't go, just certain performers, and so they have to compete to see who will go to perform for the Emperor in his obvious, obvious trap. It's a trap! But also there's going to be a ball, so we get a little bit of our fancy dress porn as well as our regular porn in this book. So the announcement is over, it's just announcing there will be a competition to compete to go perform for the Emperor, and also there's going to be a fancy dress party to kick things off. So Rora and her two friends are heading to their room, and Rora's thinking like, I have to win this competition, because apparently Rora has completely bought it hook, line, and sinker. She thinks that this is a good thing. Not suspicious at all. And she's like, I'm gonna need an update of my arm, because her arm is her cy cyborg part, and she's like, well... There's a sexy new tinkerer in town, so I should probably go and check that out. That is the end of chapter three. I'm gonna go ahead and read on to chapter four, I think. Yeah, because chapter four is pretty short, so we're gonna just keep going. Are we gonna be getting into short chapters like we have been with a lot of the other books I've been reading recently? We'll find out. Okay, we're back with Gwen, and she's supposed to be taking care of a juggler who has damaged his cyborg finger, and she's like, I don't fucking know what I'm doing because I am in fact an engineer. Which begs the question, where are all of the people who were just helping the mistress put in her new implant? Could none of them do this? Were all of them, like, hired out from somewhere else? And again, why not hire one of them to be the new tinkerer instead of friggin' Gwen? What is so special about Gwen? Apparently, not only do the sales... Uh, take in solar winds on these airships, but also they can paddle with oars in space. What? Just trying to think about Treasure Planet and if they ever did anything like that. No, they only had the sails. There was no, there were no oars. I can jump through enough hoops to make it work, but um, 
It's, it's, uh, it'd be easier just to be magic. Yeah, it'd be so much easier to just be magic. Also, the planet that Gwen is from, her home planet, is called Orthodox. And you see she's not there anymore, because Gwen is very unorthodox. Thank you. Now, see, this would take a while to get used to. Uh, her eyes now see, like, different things. Her robot eye can see, like, x-ray vision on his robotic implants, and her normal eye obviously just sees normal. So, that would be, uh, disconcerting. Love the outfit, Zark. Well, thank you. Um, love the eye. Plus, she's still recovering from her surgery, so she's just got problems. And they're expecting her to just do this job that she's never done before without anyone helping her. All of a sudden, Gwen is like a frickin' physical therapist. She takes his cyborg hand off, because she thinks that she can repair the thumb if it's not attached to his body. And he's like, what am I supposed to do in the meantime without my fucking hand? And she tells him, I recommend strength training. Squats, lunges especially, can fix your, I can fix your prosthetic thumb, but you're going to break it again if you keep relying on your cyborg hand to compensate for the heavy weight. Yeah, so she's like, giving this man advice about like, strength training and stuff. That's a lot of assumptions that she's making for somebody who works on engines and only engines. I don't believe that man's ever been to medical school. I like how squats will help them compensate <laughs> for the strain that broke their thumb. Yeah. And then she shades him and basically calls his performance stupid because he's juggling iron balls. And she's like, do something more interesting with your performance. And I'm like, excuse me? You've been at this circus like two weeks and you're already telling people how to change their acts? He does not hit her, as she well deserves, and says, what the fuck do you know? And then he leaves. And I'm like, yeah, what the fuck do you know, Gwen? Okay. Now she wishes that she could see the, the, the inside of the thumb joint that she's working on with a ship's hologram, meaning they have holograms. They have hologram technology. The technology in this book is so random. We have, I think, a typo. Uh, Gwen says there's a man riding on a tricycle on a tightrope, but then a few sentences later, it's called a unicycle. So, which one is he riding on? Boy, well, Bastion must have robot legs because his footsteps, as he's coming towards Gwen, literally vibrate the table, her work table. We get described again that Bastion is handsome but skinny. Bastion has to tell her that uh, while removing this guy's hand worked out okay, not all cy cyborg implants can be detached. So she could do somebody a serious harm trying to detach the wrong implant. She is a danger and a menace, but they're gonna let her keep working on people even though she has no idea what she's doing. <laughs> I'm in danger! Now she's going to go read a book called Cyborg Basics. She's gotta, she's gotta brush up. She's gotta read uh, Being a Cyborg Tinkerer for Dummies. I'm curious why this circus kept going. It's been years since the Emperor outlawed cyborgs. Why is this circus still going? Why don't they try to find other employment? Tuxedo Mask just fucking walked into the room. Some guy dressed all in black just walked in and handed her a rose. Okay. This guy is the archer. I think that's this is the one that um, Rora was having a pissing match with earlier. Abrican? Abrican? Carlite. Cool. He's also very tall. I, I definitely sense that the author has a thing for tall people because everybody who's handsome or sexy in this is tall. So he's getting his flirt on with Gwen and she's just not having it. Even though all that woman back at the circus has to say was, hey, you want to go behind the tent and fuck? This guy's actually having to work for it. Oh, Abrakan appears, um, appears beside her. So unfortunately, even her cyborg eye has not saved her from having a real issue with her vision. So he flirts with her, but in a kind of creepy way, although I don't know why Gwen is turned off by it, because like, Perpetually horny Gwen, you'd think she'd be into it, but this guy, she decides his is not the kind of flirting that she wants. And she decides that she wants to avoid him. For reasons. I don't know. That is the end of chapter four, and now I'm starting to fall asleep reading this, so we're gonna quit. 
but I still have a little bit of, of pie to eat. And we'll get back to the cyborg tinkerer later. Thank you for joining me for this nonsense. Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Can I take your order? Yes, I would like to order one. Afra, Melissa, AC, Swamp Goblin Waifu, Ashley, Sophia, Merween, Kit, Hidden Glade, Persephone, Light Julie, Belle, Patrick, Anne Sophie, Callison, Ray, Shelby, Zaire, Jesper, Irene, Scribbling Cat, Savvy, Jenny, Amanda, Lisa, Sarah, and Lennox. You mean I can get them all in the Patrons That Are Awesome meal? I'll take it. Zytrate comes in a little glass vial. A little glass vial? A little glass vial. And the little glass vial goes into the gun like a battery. And the Zytrate gun goes somewhere against your anatomy. And when the gun goes off, it sparks and you're ready for surgery. Surgery. surgery.